mysterywire.com, home of the unusual and unknown. From Area 51 to the paranormal, it's your source to the most vetted UFO stories and special investigations in the world. Take a journey into the universe of mysterywire.com. Richard Lang, can we start with a little bit about your background? You know, a lot of people call themselves investigators, and uh, it's just an all-purpose term, whether they're qualified investigators or not. But you've actually worked for some pretty impressive including three-letter agencies and federal uh, agencies where you really do have to do investigations, right? Exactly. Um, my, um, the, in my book, I outlined, this, this kind of all started for me. I was, um, I'm a commercial pilot, and um, I was um, just about to graduate from Embry-Riddle in Florida with my degree in aeronautics. I'm flying up the coast one night, and it's all outlined in the book. And I basically heard these airline pilots talking to the air traffic controllers, about this huge UFO that was hovering out over the ocean in their flight path. So that's kind of how I got started in it. Um, during my, um, you know, basically when I finished college, I went to work for a commercial bank and I had a really good job. I got paid well, I got a lot, you know, six, seven weeks a year vacation. So I used that to kind of do my exploration, if you will, with the, the, the UFO subject. And so essentially, um, I started um, doing investigations for MUFON, and at the same time, I'd gone and gotten um, certified as a registered as a private investigator. I took the classes just to learn how to do it, and um, you know, the the during the time of um, during the the nine eleven period, I was when I was working for the bank. I actually left my bank and went to serve in in the airports. Um, initially I was with, um, I was, uh, County deputy U S marshal, and we were basically securing the checkpoints in Charlottesville. And I got a chance to go work for Homeland security. And so for a couple of years, my job was basically to work with all the law enforcement agencies in central Virginia, anybody that had anything to do with airport security, everything from the bomb squads, the state police, the uh, ATF agents, FBI agents. And, um, you know, basically we're at work to secure our airports and protect them from terrorism. And a lot of people say, well, you know, what about UFOs? Well, that not one word was ever mentioned about UFOs during that time. We were pretty busy worrying about terrorism. So did you, at, what, at your work with the U.S. Marshal's Office, did you learn, I mean, was it part of your job is to find people who don't want to be found? Well, the part of what we were doing, it, essentially, um, when I went to work for the, the, I went to the police academy and I was a volunteer reserve guy just doing public service. Well, when 9-11 happened, um, I, I basically went full time and worked in the airport. And we were, see, essentially, when you're working in an airport environment, that's technically legally federal property. So the, they had us all go through the process of being being uh, sworn in as U.S. Marshals so that you can make arrests on the federal charges in the airport. So that's kind of it. So, yeah, police academy I've done um, when I was with um, Homeland Security, we did. I mean, half our time we spent training on different, you, you know, all kinds of things, just like. Um, anti-terrorist uh, activities and, you know, a lot of, um, a lot of work with implementing law enforcement into the airports and working with regulatory issues and all that kind of thing. I was, um, I was actually uh, part of the, um, um, that anti-terrorist group, anti-terrorist task force that we worked through the, um, the, the federal you know, through the U.S. attorney. And m one of my jobs was I was a key speaker and I would go out and talk about, you know, terrorism and and try to help police understand how the aircraft are attacked and things like that. I was just thinking as I read through your resume on the back of the book, it's like, you know, you, you were trained as a private investigator. You were a pilot. So, you know, a lot about things that are flying around in the sky. You work with the Marshal Service and Department of Homeland Security. You have a lot of idea, you know, personal experience in how government works. It's like a um, a perfect background to become a UFO investigator. You cover a lot of bases there. Well, exactly. And um, the, the thing is, is that is the, you know, when I look back on my career, I really spent a lot of time actually working with individuals, interviewing 
uh, people that have had experience, you know, experiencers, abductees. And I think in the book, I said I had interviewed over 30 people that were, you know, where I spent an in-depth amount of time working with them, trying to understand their abduction experience, you know, so, you know, over a period of 20 some years, you're out there every weekend interviewing people that have been involved in these kind of things. You start to, you know, you start to realize there's certain resonant details that seem to come into place going from one person to the other. These people don't know each other. They've never been in any contact with each other yet. When you talk to them, the little details of their stories seem to all match up. And so over a period of, you know, 20 some years, my own perception of reality changed as far as, you know, what I think and believe is possible. Let's talk about our time. So, uh, you know, it, it's perfect timing for your book, UFO Investigation Methodology for a New Age. Seems like a perfect time for that to come out because of all the, all the millions of people who are now drawn to this topic who really didn't pay attention to it before. The wave of media coverage, the, the revelations that have either leaked out or have been uh, drug out of the government and the military. There's a lot of interest that did not exist before. And suddenly, our topic is somewhat respectable. It's, a, it's amazing. So I would think there's a lot of people who want to learn how to dig into this stuff on their own. Is that what your intent was with this book? Yeah, well, essentially, when, when I originally started working on the book, the, the, it was really designed for people that like advanced training for uh, investigators and UFO researchers. And, um, you know, as it evolved and it came together, but I'm, I'm actually pretty, pretty comfortable and feeling really good that I've, we've, we've gotten the book out to a lot of people that weren't really that involved in UFOs. I mean, they know a little bit about it. They're interested in it, but they never investigated cases or did any kind of research in the, and, and they really like the book because there's a lot of stuff in there, I guess that, you know, it helps them understand how the whole, how, how this whole thing is, is like, it, it's very complex and, and how it's, it's, it's coming together. Um, and, and especially with one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot over the last few weeks, and I'm actually, we're getting ready to tr try to get another book together that's just about disclosure and the declassification. And um, I, I think what, what we're going to see is, and we, we've talked about, we, we touched on this a little bit in the book, but basically in that second chapter, I kind of gave an overview of how this all started, how the secrecy started. And, and what it, the bottom line was that during the, the Truman and Eisenhower administrations, they started farming out this research to private corporations, defense contractors. And, and I think that somewhere along the line, they probably lost control of it because some of these multinational corporations and the military industrial complex have a, a, a great deal of control over the research and technology now. So when we're looking at how disclosure is going to come come out, you know, we, we've got this thing at the end of the month, you know, the um, the off the director of national intelligence is under a congressional mandate to basically report on um, how this stuff's going to be declassified. But I like to think of it. There's really two prongs to it. First of it. First one is the government and the government is under order, you know, and they're subject to freedom of information requests and that kind of thing where um, they're going to come out and do a certain amount, de de declassifies and disclose a certain amount of information. But what, what we know that's evolved over the years, a lot of this research that's been done has been done um, very quietly through private corporations, defense contractors, multinational technology companies. And so a lot of the stuff that's been going on is, is being held by them. So when the government comes and says, we're going to disclose what we know about UFOs, you're going to get about half of it because the other half of it is, is proprietary information that's being basically held, used by a lot of big multinational corporations, if that makes sense. Well, it does. I mean, you know, I've been covering this territory for a long time myself, and yeah. I've always, uh, you know, I've come to the conclusion a long time ago that probably the most sensitive information, the goodies, are in private hands, not in government hands. So. Exactly. Exactly. You could ask the Pentagon, hey, where's the crash saucers? And they honestly don't know. I, I think, you know, it's not a monolithic organization. There's stovepipes. They don't know where this stuff is. I, it, I, they, don't, they don't have it. it. There might be a very small group of people still left inside who know. But in general, if there's bodies, if there's saucers, if there's crash debris, that's not in their hands. Don't, do you agree? 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think that, you know, a lot, the, the, the fourth chapter in my book, I talk a lot about the, the, you know, the, the project that we did with, with Bigelow and, and Bass in MUFON. And, you know, the, the, there really was two, you know, when I tried to convey that, I, I looked at it from different perspectives. First of all, the, the part that I was working, I'm basically managing an investigation team that's uh, funded by, by Bass to go out and interview these people. And then on kind of behind their, on, 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 in their world, behind the, the, the scenes in their world, they were, they were doing research that was, was completely different than maybe what we were doing. And it, when we made our deal with them in the beginning, it was clearly agreed that, you know, basically we were selling them information about, you know, uh, case reports and that any research they did was proprietary and private information and, and they didn't necessarily share it back with us. And, and I think that's what most of these defense contractors and these corporations are doing. You know, they, they have deals, they, they get information or research or, you know, um, uh, the, the book that Philip Corso and Bill Burns wrote about, about basically how they took all this, this technology that they had found in crash wreckages and, and they divvied it out to private corporations to do the research. Well, you know, fast forward 50 years, these guys have made trillions of dollars on that technology. Um, and they've developed some technology that's clearly out of this world, you know, and, and um, they're, they're under no obligation to hand it over or give it up, if that makes sense. Uh, we'll circle back around to Bass here in a minute. Let's talk, first of all, about disclosure, the UAP task force report. A lot of excitement about it, a yeah. lot of anxiety and criticism, even before it's come out, from UFO world, um, because it is not going to be disclosure. I mean, it's one of the first topics you address in your book, is the idea of disclosure, because if you're teaching newcomers to the about the topic, you have to address the elephant in the room, right? Um Give me a sense of what you expect from that report, whether you find it uh, disappointing, even though we have yet to see it, or whether you find it at least encouraging about that it exists at all. Well, I think it's, it's one of those things where once you open that can of worms up, you're never going to get the lid back on it. So anything that comes out, um, you know, what, what we're seeing now is, is uh, all of a sudden that all the video uh, you know, cockpit videos are, are, are being put on TV where, you know, the F-18s are chasing Tic Tacs around over the ocean and stuff like that. So they're starting to let that stuff out. Well, once you let it out, you, you can't get it back, you know. So the more information that comes out, it's, it's like the public is, you know, people are pretty smart now. They've got the Internet and a lot of resources. So once they acknowledge this stuff is real, then a lot of people, like you said, they were kind of making fun of it or just didn't want to think about it are going to start paying a lot of attention to it. And, and I think going forward, it's just like, once you start prying the lid of that open, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot of it's going to come out. Um, and, and, and then once it does come out, then you're going to have all the issues that, you know, all the issues that, that, that are going to have to be dealt with. Like, um, one of the things a lot of people in the UFO community are saying, and it's not, I, I see it a lot. I was actually at a conference last week and a, and a bunch of people were talking about that. These are people that have been involved with this for a long time. And they're like, oh, this is, this is really just the start of a false flag event. And, um, and, and, and basically, you know, and my point in, in the book is that, well, if you're going to have a false flag, if you're going to point the finger at the extraterrestrial bad guys first you got to admit that they're for real and that they exist kind of thing you know so i don't know that element but then um the one of the things that i think about when i when 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 you talk about declassification one of the things that always fascinated me is when they built the greenbrier they built this huge facility underneath the the the, the hotel to house congress well it was done very covertly and the money was all laundered to build this place by the local railroad company. So basically they put a new wing on the hotel and at the same time they were building the underground facility underneath the new wing. So this, this operation started back in the Eisenhower administration and it ran for 30 years, like, you know, ready to go. Well, then the Washington Post published an article about it 
and basically blew their cover. So the government declassified it. And now you can actually, it's wonderful. You can go there and take a tour for 40 bucks and they'll show it all around. It's really, it's really interesting. But the, the, what I thought was so interesting about it is when they declassified it, all of a sudden, all these, 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 like the, the, the state and, and county um, started doing investigations because these guys, you know, basically built this huge facility in the most prime real estate in the country. And, and because it didn't exist, nobody paid any property taxes or anything like that on it. Right. So the next thing you know, there are all these lawsuits and tax liens and, 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 and that are, are coming up because now they found out about it. And, and I think when we start declassifying and disclosing stuff, you're going to see a lot more of this kind of thing where, you know, stuff that didn't exist now is going to be, um, it, you know, it's going to be a, be a legal problem. Yeah, I, I was told that directly. There was a congressional investigator who came out to Area 51 in the uh, early 90s with the idea of, hey, I'm going to go out there and find out where all the stuff is because he okay. thought it was true. And then uh, he didn't find it, but he was still convinced that maybe billions of dollars had been siphoned from legitimate national security programs to keep this cover up going. And he, what he told me directly is when this comes out, people will go to jail. So right. That's there point. might be reasons reasons for the cover up that are very personal, not some gigantic uh, conspiracy. Although that could be true too. Well, I think I think that's what you're going to see is is a lot of this stuff where people have, you know, there, there's clearly, I mean, you you can it's it's well documented back in the Eisenhower administration how they funneled that money. I mean, it's, the, it's all disclosed now. They secretly funneled the money through the railroad and and used it to hide everything so they could pay everybody and build everything and and then you know one, once it comes out you've got this financial nightmare to deal with it's the same you know it's the same thing with with a lot of these people like you said that that have been involved in this stuff they're not going to be any hurry for this to um to, to come out in the open because some of them are going to be in big trouble probably let's talk about the uap task force report for a moment now we've got got some hints about what's included some of it is leaks of video and photo material that that we've reported on that uh, were in the UAPTF uh, report, a briefing document. Some of it, uh, the hint that we got about the New York Times, there's not going to be a statement that these are space aliens, of course. They, they had two people working for six months to get their heads and arms around this gigantic topic. Um, I, I think the fact that the report exists at all, that Congress asked for it, that the Pentagon is producing it, regardless of what's in it, I think that's an important step. If they do not dismiss the topic outright, it's swamp gas, it's weather balloons, that kind of thing, which is the typical response we've got from the Pentagon for 60, 70 years. Exactly. I think that's a big step forward, don't you? Yeah. And, you know, I don't, I didn't pay a lot of attention to the thing with the New York Times that basically, you know, it's my understanding that, oh, we've got this leaked document and you know, we, we know this, these things are like flying around our, our bases, but we really don't know where they're from and all that, which, you know, I mean, I, I don't see how they can really put that out there with a straight face because they, they know, they know damn well what's going on. They know a lot about it, a lot more than they're going to tell you right now. Yeah. Um, you do mention disclosure at the beginning of this book and the, you know, the concept of it. Do you anticipate that there is ever a formal statement from our government, from the president, from the De secretary of defense. Yes, these are non-human intelligence from somewhere else. We're trying to figure it out. Or would you say we're going to have to get bits and pieces as we've been doing for a long time? Well, the whole idea of disclosure, I remember a couple of years ago, we a bunch of us were talking about that in a, in a group. And, you know, there's basically two, two routes you take. One is the, okay, here it is. Here's all the dirty laundry. Here's what's been going on for 60 years. And here's what we know. And, you know, we've been in contact with, with three different extraterrestrial societies and, and boom, or they're going to feed it to you one crumb at a time. And um, that that's the, you know, the hundred year plan. So I really don't know. I was, uh, when I saw the thing with the, the, the congressional mandate to disclose the information, I was, I was encouraged because I think, once you start, once you open this can of worms up, like I said, once you get this started, it, you, you're not going to, you know, it's a big train and it's going to be moving real fast. You're not going to stop it anymore, if that makes sense. But yeah, I mean, personally, the, 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 
the 30 plus years I've spent doing this in not only in interviews, but, you know, a lot of times, as you know, people tell you things that um, that are going on behind the scenes. Sometimes you, you can't talk about it or you don't talk about it, but there's clear evidence that that not only do they know about this, but but they've been involved with some of these these extraterrestrial societies for a long time. I think wasn't Edgar Mitchell said before he died that we've been involved with, you know, something to the effect that for, for 60 years, we've been in contact with aliens, other alien races, and they're getting tired of lying about it kind of thing, you know. Um, let's talk about one aspect of investigations that you have worked on that have uh, stirred up a lot of controversy. Uh, as you worked with MUFON for a long time in a variety of different um, roles and special teams. Tell me about the, that work, the special teams, and then we'll get into Bass. Well, initially, um, initially when I was with, I was originally with MUFON and I was, like I said, I had a lot of disposable income. I had the time, you know, and, and like anything else, money means everything. So, um, you know, we were working on cases. Well, then um, the, one of the big things that sort of kicked it off was the Discovery Channel was wanting to do some shows about ufos and so um we had gone to um one of the cases that i worked on we went to fayetteville and filmed um some guys that had said that they were basically involved in an abduction experience and um so you know i we what i've learned to do and and what i try to train people to do is we use a lot of video the video camera is probably the most powerful thing that you can have when you're doing this kind of work and so you know, I'm out there and I'm, you know, video camera. I've got, I'm, you know, I interview five or six guys that are involved in this thing and we get back and start putting it together. And it's, it's starting to look like they're all corroborating each other's stories. So anyway, we sent the video and in some of the preliminary reports to the discovery channel producers, they loved it. And so they made a TV show about it, a whole full hour TV show about it. Well, then um, a few months later, there was another, there was a flap up in um, uh, Bucks County in Pennsylvania. And we went up there and actually filmed a second TV show about that one. So when you're out there working with these guys, you know, um, I spent a lot of time with uh, producers and helped coordinate some of the, you know, the, the production of the shows and stuff like that. But you really, you know, you really learn a lot by, by working on those kind of things. But that's kind of how the star team really started. There were about 10 of us and, um, that's, you know, that the Discovery Channel shows really kicked that off for us. And we got, you know, very popular and got a lot of support and that kind of thing. And um, it, we worked together and did, did a lot of specialized training. And um, then, um, you know, that I, it was just kind of like a precursor for the whole SIP project, if that makes sense. That's how it started, though. Somewhere along the way, Bass has created, it's a front for the DIA. The DIA puts out this very confidential contract, Bass is created, gets the contract under a program called OSAP. Um, and you uh, and MUFON uh, become sort of an adjunct to that. Can you describe that relationship, how it worked? I mean, you already said it was sort of a one-way street. MUFON would tell about cases, Bass would take over. You never got any information back this way, right? Well, yeah. Um, essentially what, what happened, and I have to say that the guys at Bass that I worked with were, were really credible stand-up guys. Um, and, and, you know, I'm not going to get into the, 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 you know, who they are, where they are, what they're doing, but these, some of these guys were real sharp. I mean, they're, they're very well-educated um, individuals that, that really had a lot to offer as far as investigative technology. And so when we started out, um, we basically, the program was designed where we actually, we had money to spend. So we actually hired people to be investigators. Which and, is what you've always wanted, right? MUFONS yeah, always needs exactly. money. Right? Yeah, yeah, that was, that was the, it was, it was great because basically I was hired full time to basically be the, the coordinator and manager of the program. And we had another individual that was like the operations manager. And, um, you know, when we'd, um, when we'd go out and, um, uh, you know, we'd send somebody out on a case, we had money, she'd make hotel reservations and flight reservations, and they had visa cards and all that kind of thing. So, you know, it, it was it was very well organized and structured. So when the guys went out to work on cases, 
um, everything was taken care of financially and they were all paid a hundred bucks a day plus 40 bucks a day per diem. And, you know, we had a team of one of the, I think one of the significant things was the dispatch operation. We had about a dozen people that worked as what we call dispatch operators. And essentially with the CMS system, which is where the power and all this stuff is, um, the, the, with, with MUFON, the, um, they have this, this, they have what they call a CMS system. It's, it's like a database that they've been building for, I don't know, 30 plus years since the, the, around 1970. So you've got this incredible, uh, database of, of all these case reports, investigator reports. And that's where, that's where Bass or that's what they wanted is they wanted to get into that information and, and look at those cases. So essentially what we did is we hired these dispatchers and there was always somebody on duty 24 hours, seven days a week. And what they do is they would, would at night, if a case came in, they would look at the case, they would actually contact the person, verify the, you know, the contact information, the phone numbers, all that kind of stuff to make sure that they were legitimate. Cause there are some scammers that, that do put some of that stuff out once in a while, but essentially um, they would go through there, verify all the information and try to clarify points as far as what, what happened and, and how it was all set up. And then, and then they, they would evaluate the cases because you're dealing with stuff like, you know, uh, an, an 82 year old uh, grandmother is sitting on the porch and sees a light in the sky. And then you've, you've got an airline pilot that has a close encounter with something in his flight path. So there's a dramatic difference in like what, what's, you know, what's going on out there. So what part of what these guys, a big part of what they were doing is they were going through there and calling through these things and picking out the really good cases. So the bottom line is we'd get four, 800 cases a month come in and we'd end up with probably 40 or 50 of them that were really high quality cases that we, we actually worked on. And, and then so, what, how, would, well, how did it work from there? So the cases come in, uh, okay. move on is the contact point of contact. You sift through the best of them, and then do you go out? Do you and your team do the initial? Well, well basically, or pass it on to Bass. Well, basically, what would happen was um, they they would send me the the what we call significant reportable events, and there were usually about thirty five to forty five fifty of them every every week, and so those would those cases would be forwarded on to Bass. But then what I would do is I would go through those cases and pick maybe eight or nine of them. That, that I really thought were, 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 were interesting and we could get some, some, you know, we could develop some, some good data on. And I would send the, um, I'd send the, I'd just, I'd, you know, deploy investigators to go out and, and meet the people and actually investigate the case. So they would do that. They'd go out, meet the, meet the, the, you know, the, the people that made the report, interview them, collect as much information and data as they could. And then they they come back to me and send it to me and I'd you know I'd basically have the narratives and the um, the witness reports and any photographs and video and anything that they had material evidence and I'd put that together in a very comprehensive report that would be sent to Bass every week and they'd usually get six or eight of those those reports from me every week plus they had the, the opportunity to look at the other. 30 or 40 of them that were coming in. So that's kind of how it worked. So every Friday we'd get on a conference call and go over all this stuff. You know, I, I was the point of contact for MUFON and, and essentially the way it was structured was the nobody at MUFON was allowed to have any contact with them, but me, because we didn't want all these guys bugging them and call them in the middle of the night and all this stuff, you know? So, so every Friday I would meet with these guys and there was four or five guys in, in their world on their team that we'd, we'd spend a couple, three hours together on Friday afternoon on a conference call and just go through all this information, talk about it and, and all that kind of stuff. So, so we were free to pretty much go where we, as far as I was concerned, I could send anybody anywhere I want, anytime I want, and they'd never interfere with it. Nobody ever said, well, you can't do this. You can't do that. And, and we were free to do whatever we want. We were getting paid to do it. Well, behind the scenes, our deal with them was basically that, you know, what whatever we're a proprietary company we're private and we're going to 
Um, you're, we may go back and look at some of these cases again, but we're not necessarily going to sh share our findings and our research with you because that's we're paying you to give us the information. That was right. the deal. Can you give me your assessment of whether you th thought that was underhanded since it's come out and been public? You know, the UFO folks will tee off on it as they always do on everything, but uh, that it's some kind of a deep, dark conspiracy that MUFON sold out. Seems to me you got resources that you always needed to have boots on the ground, go places, investigate things. The difference was you were sharing information with Bass, which at the time you had no idea that that was a DIA project, right? OSAP? No, no. And, and I mean, there was the, you know, the recent disclosure about how they had crash wreckage that they were working on. I mean, I would have been on my knees begging them to go over there and work for them if I knew that was going on, trust me. But everything, every encounter that everything that I had to deal with, with them was totally done on the up and up. I mean, when we, I was part of the project team when we originally put the whole thing together and we agreed from the start that, you know, we were going to send them this information. We were going to investigate these cases. We were going to do this. And, and they were very clear in indicating that they weren't sharing their information back with us. And they were paying us 55, $56,000 a month for that information. And, you know, I thought it was a great deal. And, and at the, the problem is just like anything else, there are people at MUFON that just came out of the woodwork, you know, and I remember listening to somebody on a, on a radio show one night and, and she's going on and on about, like you said, all this crap that, that you were talking about. And I'm thinking like, you know, I was there every day. I was involved in every bit of this and, and, and all the stuff she's saying is just complete crap, you know, but, but she, she got her, you know, she got her hour in the, public limelight for it so I yeah guess. i know who you mean yeah I, and she continues to peddle that that line too yeah um let's go back to to the book so you have very practical advice for people what equipment uh they need and that that helps in an investigation how to approach witnesses can you give me sort of the highlights of what you have in the book why it would work for just any individual who wants to have hands-on experience and investigate a case in say their their hometown well, when we originally, when, when we were working on the, you know, the, the SIP project and all that, there was a point where they revamped the handbook, the investigator's handbook. And, and I, I did some of the, the, the section on the equipment, but you know, that was like 20, you know, uh, 12 years ago. And in my book, I've, I've kind of, the equipment that I'm talking about in the book, I'd say probably the primary thing is the video camera. You know, I'm trying to get these guys, uh, there's a whole chapter in there, not only on how important the video is, but how to use it, how to get people to interview and, and all that kind of thing. So I'd say that's one of them. Then some of the other equipment, just, um, you know, practical common sense things that they need to have and with them. And, and not only that, but have it packed and ready to go when, when, you know, something happens because sometimes these things happen pretty spontaneously and, and you need to have everything ready to, 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 to go when the, when the case breaks. Um, part of the book that, um, that I think one of the most important things in my book is there's a couple of chapters in there. One I talk, it's called perception of reality. And um, as, as you well know, that when you start to deal with these kinds of cases, there's a lot of what they call high strangeness that's involved, the anti-physical stuff. And um, the, the, um, uh, Eric Davis and Jacques Vallée had written a paper um, that's in, 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 in my book that um, they, I, they gave me permission to, to use it in my book. But basically, it, it's, the, um, it's a model for investigating anomalous phenomena. And in some of the stuff, there's a section in they call the anti-physical uh, layer. And that's where you get into all these things that you see in case reports where things reappear and disappear. And, you know, three objects converge into one or one breaks up into three, you know, things like, um, you know, you, you see these, these reports where um, a UFO or a vehicle just goes right into the side of a mountain with no crash or impact or anything. It just goes right in there. Just like if you dropped a rock in the water and, 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 and there's, there's a, a whole bunch of that kind of stuff listed in my book that I think that people that are going to investigate this stuff have to get their, their, their head wrapped around it. And it's not easy to do because some of it's pretty, pretty way out there. And, yeah. um, 
And, 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 you know, I, I did a, there's a chapter in there about multidimensional consciousness, different states of conscious, you know, different states of reality. And, and you say, wow, you know, that's, that's really getting, he's, he's getting a little unhinged, but you know, if you look at that project that, that they did, you know, the CERN project where they've got the particle accelerator built underground and all that. I remember watching about 10 years ago, they did an interview on 60 minutes. And the guy's talking about all this stuff they're doing. And I'm thinking, you know what? These guys are trying to figure out how, what's going on in other dimensions, you know? And my friend was with me and she's like, you know, you've had too much wine tonight, you know? Uh, and, um, and at the end of the show, the guy goes, yeah, we've actually been able to identify 12 uh, dimensions of reality outside our time space reality. And I'm like, yeah, you know, well, that's, <laughs> um, that, that's part of the, that's part of what's going on here. So the average, you know, and I had, I had put together some slides back um, about the time this, you know, I think we were still running, we're just finishing up in the SIP project, but I had put together these slides and there was a, 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 a section in there about multidimensional consciousness and some of these other, you know, talking about different states of reality and stuff like that. And I had these slides. So I went up there to, I was in Pittsburgh at a conference and there was about maybe four, 450 people in there. And I, I, when I went in there, I thought, you know what, I'm going to get beat up when I start talking about this stuff. These guys are going to make fun of me or give me a bunch of crap, you know? And, and, and so I did my presentation. I was like shocked because all these people were calling me going, man, yeah, that was, you're right on with that. That's really what's going on. That was the best part of your presentation, you know? And so I, I, I over the, over the last, um, you know, over the last 10 years, when I do my speaking and stuff, I use a lot of those slides and that seems to be the part that most people seem to be most interested in and it's really the key to unlock all this stuff. Richard, could you share with uh, our viewers uh, one case, one big case, the, the tip that comes into MUFON, uh, you pass on the information to Bass that both of you may have investigated or one or the other, yeah. uh, a case that might ring a bell with the public? Yeah, there was a really famous uh, case, actually, that I think Discovery Channel Canada had done a, a show on it after we did it. But basically, it was a case where this individual, he was a nurse, practic a nurse practitioner, um, you know, well-educated man. He worked in a psychiatric hospital. He's driving home right around Christmas time, listening to Christmas music. And um, all of a sudden, he notices this light in the sky that's, 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 that's out there, but it seems to be kind of closing in on him. So he's, it's a country road. He's winding around. And finally, he gets to a point where this thing is like very huge and it's right almost on top of him. And he can only see the bottom of it. This was up in, um, um, in New York, upstate New York. So, so this thing, this, this object basically comes right over his car and there's a beam of light that comes down, hits the car. And the next thing you know, he's sitting there in the dark. The headlights go out, the dashboard lights go out, his cell phone's dead, the radio goes off. He's sitting there in the dark trying to figure out what to do. And I remember him saying, he was like, you know, I was, I wasn't sure if I should get out of the car and run or what, but it, he was starting to get really scared. Well, at some point he finally was able to get the door open and he still had the seatbelt on and he looked up out like that. And as soon as he did it, boom, it's gone, just disappeared. And, and, um, you know, I asked him, I said, well, did it fly away or what? And he goes, he goes, I don't know. I just closed the door and, and all of a sudden the car was running again. And I just got the hell out of there. I was scared to death, you know? And so we went out and interviewed him. And the first thing we noticed was that when you walked up to this car, it had this electrostatic field around it. Like if you ever open a cleaner bag with a wool sweater in it and that static clinginess, you could walk up to that car and, and put your hand out and, 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 and eight, 10 inches away, you could feel the static cling on it. It was like charged. So we did a bunch of, uh, we did a bunch of, you know, tests on the car. And basically the car had a huge magnetic field. It was like, you know, it's like when, when you're a kid in science class and you put a magnet on a nail and you leave it on there for a while, pretty soon the nail gets magnetized. Well, that's the whole front of the car was magnetic. And, you know, we had some different instruments. One of them is a simple compass that'll point to the field, you know, and um, the, the car was really heavily charged. And, and so the first, uh, the, initially I, I sent, the investigator out to check it out. And then, you know, I'm communicating with them. So at that point, 
I got on the plane and I flew out there too. I got there about a week after he did. And we went back the second time and the car still had a pretty heavy magnetic field around it. It was dissipating, but it wasn't as strong as it was at first. But after three weeks, there was still, it was still well-defined. And um, when I was interviewing the guy, one of the things that, that, that was probably most in, in, interesting of all was, um, you know, as I said, he's in the car, it's dark and, and he's, he's scared. And then when, when this object took off, everything in the car came back on. And I said, okay, so he goes, yeah, the lights were on, the dashboards were on, I could hear the radio going again, motors running. I said, okay, so you mean the motor started up, right? And he goes, no, 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 no. It didn't start up, it was just running. I'm like, what do you mean? I said, you know how when you start the car, you hear that starter motor kick in and then, and, then, and then starts. He goes, yeah, that's not what happened. I'm like, what happened? He goes, it was like you're watching a movie and you push the pause button and then you push the play button and the motor was just running again. And that was probably the most interesting concept of the whole thing. And some of the, the, the old guys, the old time investigators, a bunch of them have contacted me over the years wanting to talk about that because that's a really critical part of the phenomena it's as if time just stops for that that's, period exactly and that's exactly that, what i think it, it, it that that's how i would explain it you had told us that you've personally investigated 30 or 40 uh, abductee cases where you get to know them and interrogate them have a q and a back and forth get a sense of whether they're telling something real yeah is that uh, is this an explanation for what's called missing time yeah, I think so. I mean, a lot of cases, when you look at the case data, a lot of times you'll hear people say that when they have an encounter, all of a sudden, like if you're at night, you can hear the crickets and the dogs barking and all the night noises and all of a sudden silence. And, and I think that's what's going on is basically, you know, sound is a function of vibration. If you stop time, you're going to stop the sound, if that makes sense. And I think that there's something, you know, I, I'm not saying I completely understand it, but I know that's something that, that that's one of those little things you got to pry open and figure out. But that's definitely a factor in this, 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 if that answers your question. How often of these abductee sort of experiencer cases where you get to know the person and hear their story, um, how often do you have people who are just making stuff up? Well, I mean, I, I used to say that I can interview somebody for 20 minutes and tell them tell whether they're, they're, they're scammers or not, you know, just because you, there's things that you can ask them and you just, you know, you do this for a while, you get the a sense about what, what, what they're thinking and what's going on, particularly like, you know, if you go out and interview somebody and the first thing out of their mouth is now, listen, if I get on Larry King live, I got all the, the rights to the patents and everything for it. Right. And then of course, you know, you're completely wasting your time, you know, but most of the time, when you interview somebody like that, they've had to, they've just been scared to death. And um, I remember a long time ago, we interviewed somebody that was like, I probably shouldn't, he was a member of Congress and him and his brother had a farm. And the guy's like, look, I'm going to tell you what happened because, because this scared the crap out of me. And I just want to talk to somebody about it, but I'll deny it. If you, I'll deny I ever talked to you, if you, if you put this out in public, that's, there's a guy that you want to pay attention to because there's nothing in it for him. You know, he just wants to, to get some help to try and understand what happened to him, but he's not, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't want anything to do with any publicity or anything. Uh, one last question, this is sort of a broad one. So we now, the public now knows some reporting that we've done and others have picked up on that OSAP was the name of this program, that that's where the $22 million, $22 million secured by Harry Reid and others goes to Bass and OSAP to investigate not just things flying around in the sky, but all the other high strangeness that you mentioned before. There is a periphery, a paranormal periphery. It's not just as simple as some advanced airplane flying around. Things happen to the witnesses associated with the things they see in the sky. It's not just as simple as that. ATIP, which came later, really just looks at military cases, but not the high strangeness stuff, because it's just too weird for a lot of people to handle. OSAP, which ended, you know, way too soon, they looked at all of the evidence, no matter how weird it was, no matter where it led. Is that the approach that, that will work, that will eventually help us figure this out? Well, when, when we were working with, with Bass, the, the, the prime objective there is they were looking for cases that had to do with 
um, th they were trying to figure out the, how the propulsion worked. So if, if we had a case about a cattle mutilation or, you know, some aliens that landed on, on the front porch or, or walking around on the front porch, they didn't, want to hear, they didn't care. But, but if we had a case where something went over a building and it blew out the uh, HVA system or it set the burglar alarms off or turned the automatic lights on, any, anything that had close proximity to the ground or had any kind of effect on the ground, that's what, what we were really looking for. But in terms of the whole thing, as far as if you're going to really, you know, if we're really going to disclose what's going on here, there's a, there's a very high strangement there's a very high strangeness element that's not easily um, it's, it's not easy to get your head wrapped around it. And, and I think that's going to be one of the problems with disclosure is if you want to really get into this and explain what's going on, these people are, um, you know, they're, uh, you know, when you start talking about multidimensional events and time, you know, time warps and, um, you know, time dilation, stuff like that, they're going to be like, well, wait a minute. You know, it's like, mm -hmm. I didn't learn anything about that in Sunday school, you know? <laughs> so uh, that's, that's going to be one of the challenges, I think. It is an ex it's an exciting time right now, just to have the UAP task force, no matter what they say, at least they're not saying it's swamp gas, that, that yes. this is a legitimate, it's a legitimate mystery that deserves to be investigated. And hopefully there will be a permanent program. But you, as an investigator, you know, you have to follow the evidence where it leads. And if there's some really weird stuff that includes a UFO in the sky, you got to figure it out. You got to look at the whole entire picture, don't you think? Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's there's a chapter in my book called Perception of Reality. And that's exactly what, what I was trying to get across is that, that, you know, when you start doing this kind of work, when I started doing it, I was fresh out of flight school, had a degree in aeronautics, which is a very scientific physics type background. You know, next thing you know, I'm out there interviewing some lady that's talking about, you know, being taken up into to a ship and being examined and all that. And and I'm like, well, you know, I can remember being in those kind of the, the first couple I did. I remember I just was thinking, I just got to get out of this. This I just want to go home, get away from this lady, you know, because she's nuts. And then you'd interview another one. And then after you interview about 10 or 12 of them, you're like, wait a second, you know these guys are telling the truth. And if they are, that means a lot of the stuff I learned in physics in college isn't what we thought it was, you know? And so that's what I mean. When you investigate the, the crux of my book is to try to get these guys to, to change their perception of reality so that they can, you know, cause you're only going to get so far with cameras and, and magnetometers and, and radiation detectors. Right. Does that make Richard, sense? Absolutely. Richard, uh, thanks very much for your time. I'm going to recommend the book and then I will Thank talk you. to you Sunday. And by then I'll have read it and we can go into more detail. Look forward to it. Thanks, George.